If I spoke to you in French, it would be very short, and Valerie wouldn't get his nap. So I have to speak to you in English. I will speak slowly, and if I am speaking too fast, will you just wave your arms? <laughs> do something. Don't throw anything, but do something to tell me to slow down, and I'm happy to. Um, I would love to hear your questions. I would love to hear your comments. I would love for you to disagree with me. So please feel welcome to do that. And we'll talk about you know, negotiation, why I think it's so important, why I think it's important to you, and, and why you know, it's become a little bit of a religion for me, especially for women, because I think it's just something we need to be able to do well. But for men, you need to do it well, too. So you're not off the hook. All right, so can everyone hear me? Yes. So let me share with you first my journey, how I got to this stage, um, talking to you about negotiations. And that may help you understand why it's something that I hold so dear and something I believe in so much. And Mr. Camera Person, if I move out of range, you can let me know, too. Um, so I'm trained as a lawyer. And as a lawyer, I was a prosecutor in California, which meant that it was my job. I was employed by the state government. And it was my job to present evidence against people accused of crimes. And sometimes I would be the person deciding which crimes they should be charged with. But most of the time, I was the person in the courtroom who was talking to 12 jurors about the case, right? And trying to persuade them that somebody has committed a crime. So when you start out in a prosecutor's office, you prosecute uh, what we call petty thefts. That's when people steal little things. And then you prosecute people who are driving when they've had too much alcohol. And you prosecute people who punch each other but don't really hurt each other very much. And then you work up to the bigger things. And the bigger things I worked up to were that I um, prosecuted people who murdered children. And it was very interesting because there were two kinds of evidence that were important in those cases. One was the medical evidence, what happened. And the other was psychological evidence that often the defense was, the person accused would say, you can't hold me responsible because I didn't know what I was doing. Right? So he or she would hire a psychiatrist or a psychologist to examine them and then get on the stand and say that the person didn't know what they were doing. And I got to cross-examine that person, which was the most fun you could ever have because Basically, they have no idea what they're talking about. And so I got to question the psychologist or the psychiatrist who said the person didn't know what they were doing. And so I did those cases until the end of my career where I did what we call fraud cases. And so that's where people would steal other people's money, but not by you know, hitting them over the head and taking their purse, but through complicated schemes through lying to them about what things were worth. Sometimes people would sell houses that they didn't own, right? which is a really good deal if you can get away with it. Um, and one of the cases that I tried that made me realize how important gender was, was I tried a case against two clergy people. And they were accused of stealing billion, millions, not billions, millions of dollars from very old people. So what they would do is they would have, they would use the fact that they were clergy as a way to get people's trust, right? And then they would say, hey, if you need to make some more money, I know that you're retired, and I know that you have you know, only a little you know, money saved, but if you give me that money, I can invest it for you and make you more money. Okay. And they did that to lots of people who gave them their entire life savings. And big surprise, the people didn't get it back. Right? So I was prosecuting them, which I was delighted to do. And they, uh, there were two very fancy lawyers on the other side. 
and dressed up in fancy suits. And, um, and I, just as though you can get the visual picture, I was eight and a half months pregnant with my son. So I was, I looked like a whale, right? And so here were these two fancy lawyers on the other side and me and my very large stomach. And so um, the lawyers on the other side made a really big mistake. And it had to do with gender. What they did is they left, you know, you can, you have a system in the United States where you can select jurors and you're allowed to challenge a certain number of jurors. So what they did is they challenged all the men. So they were left with mostly women. And do you know why they did that? Two reasons, both wrong. Reason number one, the women would be softer, more sympathetic. They would look at these two clergy people, handsome young guys, and say, oh, if they did something wrong, they didn't mean to, right? That women would have, they decided that women would have a bigger heart and not be as interested in sending these two nice young men to jail. Number two, they thought that this was a very complicated case. I had to show where money went from here to here to here. You know, it was very complicated because when you do these kind of cases, you, you know, send the money to a lot of places in hopes that, you, that you know, the authorities can't follow the trail. And they thought that these women weren't smart enough to be able to figure out this very complicated case. And they were so wrong about that. Because even though these women, many of them were not highly educated, guess what they did? They controlled the finances in their own households. They paid the bills. They, you know, they controlled the flow of money. And some of them, even controlled the finances in their family-owned businesses. And those businesses were not so big, but they still controlled the finances. They paid all the bills, right? They bought the supplies. They did all the things you have to do with money when you're taking care of the bookkeeping. I knew, so long as they could do that, that's all I needed. And then it was up to me to explain it to them clearly enough. If I couldn't explain it clearly enough, that was my fault. Right? So, not only did these women convict these guys in a very short period of time, but some of them were ready to drive them to prison themselves. I mean, they were so mad. Talk about not having any sympathy. These women were ready to just ship these guys off forever. They had no sympathy. They were angry. They were very angry that these people had taken advantage of elderly, vulnerable people, and they hoped that they, were, that they spent a lot of time in jail. And they did, I'm happy to report. So isn't that interesting though? Because what happened there is a, a, is a gender stereotype gone bad, right? A stere that somebody was banking on, somebody was assuming that they understood women because Women are soft-hearted, right, and forgiving. They understood women because we might be cute, but we're not that smart, right? And they didn't understand women at all, right? They made, they made two very serious mistakes, and that was my, to my benefit. So that I just thought was very interesting. And then it, I began to pay more and more attention to ge when gender matters. Another way that gender mattered in the courtroom is the way in which people tell a story. So witnesses who are on the witness stand tell about what they saw, what happened, whatever they're there to testify about, right? But you know what you notice, and you may have noticed this too, that women speak differently than men. That men speak more powerfully, not all men and not all women, but the linguists and the studies on this are pretty convincing. All right? So men speak more directly, more powerfully. They don't, put, they don't put phrases like I think and maybe, right? And women, no matter what their education level, 
speak more equivocally. I'm not sure about this, but I think the answer is, right? I'm not an expert in this, but what I think is, right? Have you noticed it, right? That, that women don't speak as powerfully. And so there was a jury study and they looked at transcripts of three months worth of jury trials in North Carolina, a state in the South. And then they asked jurors, based on these transcripts, how it affected, like wh which were the witnesses that they believed. And it turns out that the witnesses that spoke more powerfully were considered more believable and more competent. And the witnesses, many of them women, who spoke less powerfully were not considered to be as believable and as knowledgeable. The fact of the matter is, it was all a perception because it didn't really have to do with how much they knew or how much they saw or how sure they were about what they saw. It was all in the manner of delivery. And so what we notice and what the linguists have noticed is that men and women talk differently. And Deborah Tannen, who's a linguist out of Georgetown, did this very interesting study of women in meetings. And she would have women, you know, she'd, she'd tape record women in meetings at all levels of their careers. And then she'd listen to this, the same thing happen over and over again. And what it was, was that women would come up with ideas and then a man would have, say, the same idea, and then he would get credit for it, right? And the reason it happened is because when the women came up with their ideas, they came up with them in a very timid way. So they'd say, well, I'm not sure about this, but I'm thinking maybe what we should do is X. And the men would say, what we should do is X, right? Now, both of them probably had the same amount of confidence in the answer, but the men were able to state it more powerfully. And then what happens when you ask people in the meeting who had the idea, everybody thinks the man had the idea because he said it more powerfully. 